So we're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 23, verses uh, 50 to 54. And so a few weeks ago, we looked at uh, how Mary Magdalene experienced uh, the risen Christ at the garden tomb. Today, we're gonna look at a person, the person who placed uh, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ in the garden tomb. And, and what's interesting is that um, th there's one of the verses actually in this, in this set of passages has, has a little bit of a mystery to it um, that we'll explore in brief. So uh, with that, let's have a look at our text. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been lain. It was a day of preparation and the Sabbath was just beginning. So um, just a quick look at uh, the when and the where are we. So. We're in Jerusalem. Uh, our verses take place um, at pa Pontius Pilate's headquarters and he was known to stay at actually Herod's palace in Jerusalem, Golgotha, as John had presented during um, communion, um, and the garden tomb. And uh, Golgotha we're familiar with um, and then there's a garden tomb which presumably was not too far away from Golgotha. And, and just for more context, this is just a, a guess as to where Arimathea was. Uh, no one exactly knows where for sure it was. Um, it possibly north of Jerusalem, maybe a day, maybe a two uh, of, of walking. And then just a quick snapshot of Jerusalem. Uh, the red circle is where our events take place today. So you can see that Jesus' presumed tomb is very close to Golgotha and that's, that's gonna become very important in just a little bit. Uh, and the other thing to point out here is that um, while Joseph is the only one mentioned in Dr. Luke's account, uh, we know that Nicodemus was there at least um, with Joseph when Joseph buried the body or entombed the body. And while it may seem kind of strange to us that Joseph is the only one mentioned, um, it, ancient writers had a tendency to, if you had a group of people, it's usually, it was tradition that they would mention just the spokesperson of that group. It's like mentioning the leader of that group, typically. Um, that's, that's how, that's how uh, ancient tradition was when they were writing. So the when is in verse 54, so we're gonna skip around just a little bit. It was a day of preparation for the Sabbath, and the Sabbath was just dawning. So the Sabbath, again, uh, ran from about 6 p.m. Friday evening to 6 p.m. Saturday evening. And there were certain things that were forbidden, uh, that they were, Jews were forbidden to do on the Sabbath, so that they had to have a day of preparation because they couldn't do any labor and they had to cook and uh, take care of the animals and, and do other things. So one thing that, that stands out about Joseph is that uh, even though we're, we're uh, using Dr. Luke's translation, he's m important enough to have been mentioned in all, all four gospels as the person who placed Jesus in the tomb. So let's start with our first verse and we're gonna switch over to the Amplified Translation as you see there. A man named Joseph, who was a member of the council, Sanhedrin, uh, Jewish high court, a good and honorable man, he had not consented to the council's plan and action. A man from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who was waiting for and expecting the kingdom of God. So we're told that Joseph was a member of the Sanhedrin. So that means he was a very well-educated man. Um, he was in a leadership position. He was a person who was most likely held in high esteem by his fellow Jews. And, and being a member of the Sanhedrin meant that Joseph was similar to a senator or a congressperson today. That's how high they were during that time. And the San Sanhedrin were uh, the same group that had convicted the Lord Jesus Christ in a corrupt trial. Um, they were possibly the same group that actually mocked the Lord Jesus Christ while he was hanging on the cross. Um, and this was also the same group that had convinced Pontius Pilate to sentence Jesus to death. And this was the group that Joseph was a member of. But we're told that Joseph was a good and honorable man. And some translations will have righteous or just. Um, good and honorable basically means that Joseph was a man who had high morals, he was, he was presumably a, a very compassionate man. He believed in justice 
He believed in truth and he believed in upholding the law. And this actually brings us to our first lesson point. Joseph lived in the world but was a follower of Jesus. And this is not a justification for uh, anyone looking and acting and believing in what the world does while hanging on to the label of being a Christian um, because they're not compatible. Joseph was in the world of the Sanhedrin and of the religious elite, but he believed that Jesus said who he said he was. And while the rest of the Sanhedrin had dismissed Jesus as the Messiah and as God incarnate, Joseph believed. And, and, what's, and that's what's expected of, of us Christians, to, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, even though the world around us is telling us that, that our beliefs are in vain, that they're just based on stories that aren't actually true, that there's no way that a God would condescend to people that he created and come down to those people, much less die for those people. And it's even crazier to them that this same God would actually rise from the dead and would perform all these miracles and eventually ascend to heaven but leave his Holy Spirit with us to guide us. For the Christian, the, the life we're living, if you think about it, is almost like a crosswalk where the crosswalk is meant to keep us in line where the world is the rest of the intersection. We're just doing the best we can to cross one end of the street to the other and unfortunately the world is trying to pull us off the crosswalk um, where we're in danger of getting run over. So if you can think of that analogy. Although what's interesting is that, and I don't have the citation here, but in the Gospel of John, we're told that Joseph was a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jews. John is the only one who mentions that. Um, it's unknown why the other gospel writers didn't. Um, but So th this implies that any interaction that Joseph had with Jesus was in private, just like Nicodemus in John chapter three, um, for fear of the Sanhedrin. Uh, but John isn't criticizing Joseph. He's actually highlighting a positive aspect of Joseph. He, because in, uh, in John's gospel, he also writes that there are members of the religious class, the ruling class, in Israel who believed in Jesus, but they said nothing because they didn't want to be excommunicated by the Sanhedrin. They feared the loss of their position. They feared that the, whatever prestige that they had, that their positions brought them would be taken away, that the, the, the kudos and everything that they got from everyone would stop, that, and their friends in high places and their popularity and their money would just disappear. But John isn't saying that about Joseph, at least he's not saying it harshly because it was both Joseph and Nicodemus who showed up to care for Jesus' body when no one else showed up. Not even Jesus' disciples. They were nowhere to be found. So in verse 51, we're told that Joseph had not consented to the council's plan and action. So this is where Joseph differs from those that John was criticizing uh, for being secret Christians. That, that Joseph didn't consent to the council's plan means that Joseph at one point spoke his mind. He actually let people know that he believed in, in what this Jesus of Nazareth was saying. And we don't know if he was the lone dissenter because obviously that Nicodemus as well was one of the Sanhedrin. Uh, and we don't know if he, he just abstained from taking a vote to condemn and, and have Jesus executed. Um, but either way, the fact that he disagreed with the council would have gotten Joseph into trouble with the Sanhedrin. And we don't know what the consequences were for him disagreeing or abstaining. Um, it probably didn't matter to the gospel writers anyway because uh, what they're highlighting is the fact that Joseph made the right choice. And, and this is a reality that we all have to face. And, and really, it's a reality for the believer and the non-believer that any one of us can be corrupted and lose our moral compass over time. We, we know that the Pharisees started out with good intentions and then 200 years later, they turned out to be the villains. So anyone can be corrupted and lose their moral compass over time and not even realize it, especially when they lose sight of the actual truth of what scripture says and when they lose sight of who Jesus is and why he came and who he came for. How, how Joseph didn't, in, didn't give in to this group think, um, this, it's almost like a cultish mentality, is, is that we're told that he was waiting for and expecting the kingdom of God. Joseph was most likely part of, of what was known as, as the believing remnant. So this was a small group of Jews 
who, uh, e even though they, they were a tiny minority, they, they actually believed in the prophecies of a Messiah. They, they were praying for the Messiah to come, just like Simeon and, and Anna, who, who we've read, uh, who were mentioned in, in the Gospels as well. And, and this small number of people, just like Joseph, they knew that Jesus was who he said he was. And so this brings us to our second lesson point. Joseph did have earthly riches, but he was seeking a heavenly inheritance. So whatever Joseph had in this life, it clearly didn't matter. Uh, his wealth didn't matter. His, his position as a member of the ruling class didn't matter. Whatever popularity he gained didn't matter. Only the kingdom of God mattered. And because uh, to the first century Jew, their, their expectation of the kingdom of God or sometimes the kingdom of heaven is also used. It's, it's different of what we may consider today. We, sometimes we think of a place where first century Jews, their idea of the kingdom of God was is that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is where God is the ruler, where he's sovereign. So wherever Yahweh God rules and wherever Yahweh God reigns, then that's where the kingdom of heaven has come. Whether that's a person, whether that's a family, whether that's a community, they live under the reign and the sovereignty of God. That's, that's the concept of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And that, that's a spiritual reality amongst the believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, and Joseph was one of those first century believers and because he was a believer, he took action. And so we're told that Joseph went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. So we, we talk a lot about the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and how, how they love their reputation and their prestige, but none of them were interested in approaching Pontius Pilate after Jesus had died. And, and by this point, Pilate was just fed up with the Jews anyway. I mean, they, they bullied him into, into condemning Jesus to death. They rallied up the crowd around, uh, around um, uh, Pilate to convince him to convict Jesus. Now they, he gave them a choice between Jesus and Barabbas. They chose Barabbas. They didn't choose Jesus. And then Pilate is so frustrated, he actually physically washes his hands of the matter. And so this is not the man you want to go to after Jesus has died and talk to him. Give me the body. And yet Joseph actually does. He goes to Pilate, he asks for the body. And, there, and there's also a sense of urgency by Joseph as well, because first off, this was a day of preparation, and the Lord Jesus Christ gave up his life at about 3 p.m., and at 6 p.m. would be the start of the Sabbath, and the Sabbath obviously was a day of rest. And the religious elite wouldn't have wanted the Sabbath celebration marred by bodies hanging on a cross to rot over the Sabbath for the next 24 hours or 36 hours, however long it was. But there's another reason for the sense of urgency that Joseph had. The Romans were known to take the crucified bodies of criminals and either one, leave them on the cross to rot and to get eaten up by whatever animals were in the area, the birds, or they just took the bodies and they threw them into a trash heap that was typically nearby the place of execution. And if they'd done that, the Sanhedrin loyalists had gotten their hands on Jesus' body, who knows what they would have done to the body to desecrate it further. And they'd gone as far as murder, so why not? Uh, what, what's to stop them from, from being like the Romans and doing something disgraceful to Jesus' body? To serve as a warning to others who would disagree with them. And, and th this possibility should actually be a warning to us because when, when you get a, a group of established religious elite like the Sanhedrin, like the Pharisees, and they start acting like the Romans, the, the, and these are the very people that they're complaining about, then that's where compromise, that's where spiritual blindness start to take root. When, when people obviously get blind to their own failings and don't want to course correct, eventually that ship is gonna hit something and it's gonna go down and all hands are gonna be lost on the ship. So we have to wonder, though, why Joseph of Arimathea would go through such lengths to get Jesus' body. And so this leads us to our third lesson point. The events at the cross changed Joseph's life. So this is an example of a person coming to, to true faith in Christ. There, there's the belief, and a lot of people believe in Jesus. They, they, they'll say he was a good teacher, or he was a wise man, or he was a prophet. But what Joseph did, this is where belief leads to a changed life. 
This is where belief turns into action. This is where a person steps forward and commits themselves to Christ. This was Joseph's public declaration of faith by going to Pontius Pilate and say, give me his body. And the, the Pharisees and the, the Sanhedrin and, and all of their past and even their, their present equivalents thought that they were living the right way and they refused to believe anyone that didn't fit into their mold of who the Messiah uh, was supposed to be. But Joseph, figuratively and spiritually um, speaking, stepped out of darkness and stepped out of his spiritually blind religious life and stepped into the light of genuine belief in the Son of God, the Son of the living God. And, and this, this is what the cross of Christ does to the Christian, it changes lives. And a changed life is a litmus test for people claiming to be Christians. If a person's wants and desires and their attitudes and how they treat people are the same after they've committed themselves to Christ and after they've gotten baptized, then that's not evidence of a changed life. In, in this case, the cross changed the life of one man such that he would dare to stand before an already angry governor to care for Jesus' body. And so after receiving permission, he took it down and wrapped it in a linen burial cloth and laid him in a tomb cut into the rock where no one had yet been laid. So th there's two questions that, that could come to mind here. Um, the first is, why would a rich man have a tomb in a city that wasn't his hometown? That's the first thing. And the second is, why did Joseph have the tomb ready upon Jesus' death? So this, this is a really strange place for a rich man to, to have a tomb, if it was actually intended to be Joseph's tomb. Um, could you imagine his family members traveling from wherever Arimathea was uh, to visit his tomb, which is basically just a stone's throw away from where people are being actively executed? This is not the appropriate location for the tomb of a rich man. During ancient times, if you were rich, and you know your days are coming to a close, you'll want your fi the final resting place of your body to be in your homeland or in your hometown. This is, this is tradition. So Jacob, who God renamed Israel, um, he died in Egypt, but he wanted to be buried in the cave of Machpelah, which was his family tomb. Joseph, his son, uh, even though he too died in Egypt, um, when the Jews escaped, uh, they took his remains out of Egypt and eventually buried them outside of Egypt. The, the location is, is unknown um, where they buried his body. This Joseph was from Arimathea. So he would have wanted to be buried in Arimathea. That's his, home, that's his hometown. And also, how did Joseph know to have a tomb ready nearby? And the simple answer is also our final lesson point. Joseph read and believed all that was in the scriptures. He would have known the Old Testament prophecies and would have seen them fulfilled in Jesus. He would have, he would have known about Micah 5.2, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And Joseph would have heard the stories of the Magi from the east, following a star to Bethlehem, looking for the one who was born king of the Jews. And he would have heard of Jesus fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. All of these prophecies Joseph would have been familiar with and he knew that Jesus had fulfilled them all. Um, and also, how would uh, Joseph and Nicodemus just suddenly have 65 pounds of costly spices and a burial cloth on hand just because during Passover week those were the things to have? Um, is it realistic that from the time Jesus was arrested sometime during the night before uh, to his death maybe 16 hours later that these two men um, were able to get all of that done, you know, carving out a tomb out of stone, out of rock, in order to place Jesus' body in. This is more like something that they had planned ahead of time. They knew and they believed and they took action. And, and there's one more nugget here. Um, as the late Warren Wearsby points out, Passover lambs by tradition were slain on the day of preparation at 3 p.m. That is the exact day and the exact time 
that the Lord Jesus Christ gave up, gave up his last breath, as John read for us. Jesus is the Passover lamb of God, slain for the sins of men. This is not coincidence, but the fulfillment of scripture. All of these actions that Joseph took before Jesus died and immediately after his death show that, G that Joseph believed, truly believed what the scripture had said. And it's our charge to do the same. Everything about how to live life as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ is found in scripture. The Bible reveals the character of God and how to live and how to model your life after the character of God. And we see here in our, in our, in our verses that Joseph was a good and righteous man. He was good and righteous as a result of his study, as a result of his understanding of scripture. And he allowed scripture to mold his thinking. He knew right from wrong because of scripture. He didn't let the world or the Pharisees or the, Sa or the Sadducees or, or the Sanhedrin skew his view of what was mentioned in scripture. And Joseph was actually actively looking um, for the, and waiting for the kingdom of God. He wasn't the, I'm, I'm in Sunday and I'm free for the rest of the week to do what I want kind of, kind of person. But that also says that he wasn't perfect. It, he was a human like us and he had his failings. And we don't know to what extent his wealth affected his thinking when the council took its vote to convict and, uh, to convict the Lord Jesus Christ. But sometimes, and we all know this, the world and the flesh and the devil, they are going to try to instill doubts and fears into us that we may lose everything because we're followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And perhaps Joseph did fear losing his wealth and losing his status. And he didn't openly dissent to the council. But ultimately, he made the right decision. He stepped forward. And so this actually leads us to our three questions. So the first one is, is are you living your faith in secret? So we, we can't be uh, the undercover secret agent Christians. Uh, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's, there's a big difference between genuinely having faith and showing off to others. Um, others who see you at a church function or see you going to church or you know, the, the, the folks who will post selfies of themselves. Hey, I'm in worship today. To live your life openly as a Christian without showing off means that you're displaying the character traits of someone who follows the God of the Bible. And the best way to know if you're displaying those traits is to understand what the fruit of the Spirit is. And you can find that in Galatians 5. That's love that manifests itself as concern for others. It's joy, it's inner peace, it's patience. And that's how we act while we're waiting, not just the act of waiting. It's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness, it's self-control. And then there, there are qualities that the Apostle Paul calls in the same chapter the acts of the flesh, um, which, and this is just a sampling, sexual immaturity, impurity, a sensuality that manifests itself as a lack of self-control, idolatry, jealousy, fits of rage, factions that basically manifest themselves as promoting a false Christian doctrine. And then there's envy, drunkenness, and the list goes on. Both lists go together, and they have to because one is our roadmap and the other one is a warning. And a person can dress themselves any way they want with the best clothes on church Sunday. And they can go around on Sunday looking humble and penitent, but the reality of who they really are is, is seen when they leave the walls of the church. And so what do people see in them for the rest of the week, the, the acts of the flesh or the fruit of the spirit? Um, and asking this question leads to our second question. How has the cross of Christ changed your life? So it's not an easy question for most of us to answer because sometimes we'll go to the default answer, which is Jesus paid a debt that he did not owe because we owed a debt that we couldn't pay. Um, but how has God incarnate dying on the cross for you, paying the penalty for your sin changed your life? Have you taken time to look back to see how much the Holy Spirit has changed your life. Maybe you swear a little less than you used to, or maybe you've stopped using God's name as a curse, or you catch yourself before you do it. Or 
maybe you're in a position of authority and you don't take advantage of the freebies anymore like others are doing that you might have done in the past. Or maybe you're more patient will, with that elderly family member of yours who, who has to spend a lot more time thinking about what they're going to say before they speak. Or maybe someone cuts you off on the highway and you just want to slam on the gas pedal and catch up to them and give them a piece of your mind, but you don't. Or when your group of friends who you haven't seen um, in a long time uh, convince you to go out with them and do something dumb or unethical or inconsiderate. And like when you were teenagers or in your 20s and you actually say no to them. And there's a story that uh, St. Clair Ferguson tells of a young man who first showed up in a church. He wasn't a Christian. And uh, after a few weeks, he believed what the scripture said, what the gospel said. And so he, got, he, he made a decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He got baptized. And then about six months later, he walked up to some of the elders of the church. And he said, you know, for the last six months, you know, the, the worship hymns that we're singing have gotten better. And, and the, what the preacher is preaching has gotten better over the last six months. And the elders just had to kind of laugh because the hymns weren't any better. They were the exact same hymns. The sermon wasn't any better. It was the exact same preaching. What had changed was that the Holy Spirit was working on that young man and had changed his life and had changed his heart. So do you see some of these changes in your life? Or if, if you have, then you're like Joseph and you've stepped out of darkness and into light. And when, when Joseph went to Pontius Pilate to claim Jesus' body, that became his public proclamation that he was a follower of Jesus. For, for many of us, that pu public proclamation was our baptism uh, because it symbolized our choice to die to ourselves and to rise up in new life in Christ, to leave the darkness of what the world has to offer and to step into the light and the light offered by the Son of God. So how has the cross of Christ changed your life? And finally, something we didn't address in our main study, but we'll, we'll take a look at it now. Does the death of Christ move you to lavishly care for his church? So Joseph cared for Jesus' physical body. So it's our responsibility to care for, for the body of Christ, and that's his church. And we can see from Joseph's example how much he cared for the body of Christ. He, he took Jesus' body down from the cross. He wrapped it in linen. And then he laid it in a tomb, in, in a tomb where no one ever, had ever lain before. And he paid for all of that. This lavish treatment for, uh, for the body of Christ doesn't make sense, to, at least to the uh, human eyes back then, because according to them, he didn't deserve any of it. He was, he was seen by worldly eyes as being poor. He had no permanent home during his ministry. He grew up in Nazareth, which is just the wrong side of town. He worked with his hands for a living. He, he wasn't wealthy, and yet in death, he was treated as a wealthy man, as Joseph would have been treated. If people looked at the body of Christ as a whole this very day across the world, what would they see? Would they see the church body cold and shivering and exposed to the elements? Would they see the church wearing tattered rags or clothes with holes in need of patching? Would they see widows and orphans neglected? Would they see a church dressed well on the outside and yet on the inside full of arrogant pride and sinful prejudice? Would they see the church wandering aimlessly down the streets drawn to teaching that is just false enough to sound true? Or would they see a church body that worships the preacher instead of Yahweh God? Kind of like the Pied Piper of Hamlin who plays the pipe to lure the rats out of town and then when the town doesn't pay him, he plays his pipes and he lures all their children out of town and the children leave and they're never seen or heard from again. So what do people see when they look at the church? And the, the same lavishness that Joseph of Arimathea showed Jesus' body must inspire us to have lavish hearts when it comes to the church body. Are we continuing to pray for each other daily? There are so many prayer needs and many of them are unspoken. Are we continuing to check on each other and minister to each other? And some of you are really good at reading faces and, and seeing when someone is having a bad day even though they say 
that they aren't. And all of you have gifts that you can use for God's glory where the world urges us to spend it on ourselves. So there will always be a special type of need within the church and beyond our walls. And there are those, and those are needs that God has placed in our path to address only as we can as believers with the unique gifts that God has given us. The life of Joseph of Arimathea, it just, he just appears in just a few short verses in each of the four gospels. But his example carries on to this day. And may his example impact you far beyond the walls today and throughout your time on this earth. Joseph's actions at Golgotha and the garden tomb glorified Yahweh God. So let's make a promise to ourselves to do the same. And with that, I will let Nathaniel lead us in one more song. Unfortunately, I forgot what it was, but we'll see it soon. Um, and just to encourage you that if there's one thing that you can think about this week, think about how your life has changed because of the cross of Christ. And be thankful for how the Holy Spirit has changed you and is molding you, maybe not in the most pleasant ways, but molding you to be more like his son, molding you to take on the character of his son. And so that when people see us as a church body, and I know people do, people have said that this is a loving congregation, but the lavishness, let's, let's develop the endurance to carry that on.